and all colleagues and friends of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. This session focuses on the global response to challenges of integrated reconstruction of, of heritage in post-trauma recovery. There will be four presentations by distinguished colleagues who will address the topic of the session with, from different perspectives. The presentations uh, will be made by Mr. Monir Bushnaki, Special Advisor for the UNESCO Director General. And the presentation is about political will and strategic and integrated reconstruction, the example of Angkor. The second presentation is by Mr. Valérie Frelon, Executive Director of the International Alliance for the Protection of Heritage in Conflict Areas, ALIF, Ms. Alexandra Fibic, Project Manager, and Mr. Andrea Balbo, Project Manager. And the presentation will be made by Ms. Alexandra Fibic, and it focuses on ALIF's experience in protecting heritage to build peace, the early lessons of ALIF's efforts to protect heritage in conflict and post-conflict areas. The third presentation has been prepared by Ms. Magdalena Marcinkowska, uh, who is an independent researcher, and it is about recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage, the socioeconomic approach. And uh, the present, unfortunately, uh, as she is not with us today, uh, the presentation uh, will be uh, presented by Mr. Mohamed Bizian of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage on her behalf. The fourth presentation is by Mr. Ali Dos Ertugol, head of the Archite Architectural Heritage Department of IRSICA, and it is about the strategy and actions of IRSICA for post-trauma heritage reconstruction and recovery. Towards the end of the session, we will have a reflection discussion with three esteemed panelists, Mr. Mohamed Awaida, uh, of his, who is the uh, World Bank Coordinator for Cultural Heritage and Sustainable Tourism, Ms. Zainab Kulunal, Professor of Matilda's Technical University, and Ms. Sinada Demirovic Habibija, President of the Urban House, Idia Mostar. So, welcome, everyone. Uh, integrated reconstruction involves the engagement of communities in key decisions, participation in cultural life, and access to cultural heritage. Socio, social, economic, environmental, cultural, and other aspects need to be taken into consideration in the process. The global response to integrated recovery of heritage taking into consideration socioeconomic aspects has been increasingly addressed over the past years. UNESCO has led or has contributed to several initiatives, some of which have been mentioned during these three days of the conference or during the webinars that were organized within the framework of the conference. The response to post-conflict reconstruction has been carried out through conducting damage assessment and documentation, identifying priorities, and through reflections on reconstruction and recovery in urban context and at cultural heritage sites. In these processes, we have been sharing the various views and approaches together with the international community. UNESCO has also worked with its partners, such as the World Bank, to integrate culture in the reconstruction and recovery of cities. The UNESCO World Bank position paper on culture in city reconstruction and recovery provides a people-centered and place-based approach. In addition, UNESCO has led several projects and initiatives, including the Revive the Spirit of Mosul initiative that was presented during the study session of this conference. So without uh, further uh, ado, uh, we can maybe start with the first presentation now uh, by um, a dear colleague and friend, uh, Mr. Munir Bushnaki. And it is about the political will and strategic and integrated reconstruction and by providing the example of Angkor. Mr. Bunir Mushnaki is currently advisor to the Director General of UNESCO and the Director General of ICROM. He himself has served as Director General of ICROM between 2005 and 2011, after a long career at UNESCO. At UNESCO, he was Assistant Director General for Culture, Director for the Division of Cultural Heritage, and Director for the, of the World Heritage Center. He contributed to the launching of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage in Bahrain between 2013 and 17. 
Before joining UNESCO, he was director of antiquities, museums, and historic monuments in Algeria. He has a PhD in archaeology and ancient history from the University of Aix-en-Provence, France. Inter alia, he has been a long-standing member of the International Coordinating Mechanism for assistance provided by various countries and organizations for the safeguarding and development of the historic site of Angkor. Dr. Bushnaki is the author of several books and articles, including the most recently published Mutilated Heritage in 19, uh, in, sorry, in 2017. So, uh, Mr. Bushnaki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, my dear colleague and friend May, Shair, or to pronounce it uh, for Amra. Uh, I am very, very pleased and honored to be with you. Uh, I, I missed the, the first two days because we were uh, in New York with Sheikh Amey Al Khalifa at the World Monuments Fund, and we could not, uh, you know, change the dates uh, of the board of thirties of the World Monuments Fund in New York. So I only registered uh, an introduction, uh, thanks to the support of uh, Mohammed Bouzian, my colleague and friend, and Khansa and, and Selma here. And I know that all this work is done very close collaboration between Sheikh Ibrahim uh, Al Khalifa and uh, Amra, uh, who is really uh, a pillar for this uh, topic, very important pillar. Uh, I wanted to present to you in uh, only a short time, uh, an example of a, a model that uh, uh, I find interesting uh, to be better known. And I, I took the model of Encore uh, to show the, how the political will at the highest level of, the, of a country is uh, having an impact and an impact that we can see up to now uh, in uh, Cambodia for the site of Encore. And uh, I want to just refer for the recent publication done by uh, Cambodia, by Dr. Keria uh, from Cambodia and Dr. Nao Hayashi from Japan working at UNESCO, and who said in September 1991, King Nordon Sianuk, as president of the Supreme National Council of Cambodia, issued a solemn appeal to the international community to safeguard the Angkor monuments. In October and November 1991, the 26th session of the UNESCO General Conference adopted, therefore, a resolution to establish an international mechanism to ensure the conservation and development of Angkor. After the peace agreements signed in Paris, His Royal Highness Norodom Sianuk, before becoming King of Cambodia, requested UNESCO to coordinate and facilitate international assistance for Angkor in July 1991. And here you see Federico Mayor, the direct, former director general of UNESCO, with the uh, King Norodom Sianuk and his wife. And I was present to this meeting. And this is a, a very important moment and very historical moment where I, I listened to the King saying to the director general, director general, our country is in a disaster after more than 20 years of, of war, after a genocide of more than 1 million people. But I have a priority now. I want you, UNESCO, to assist us in recognizing Angkor as a World Heritage Site and uh, helping us recovering uh, the, uh, the, this site. I think this is a very critical a statement uh, that I wanted to underline uh, uh, from the part of the highest authority at the time of uh, Cambodia. Of course, we were not starting from scratch. Uh, at, at that time, I was the director of the Division of Cultural Heritage, and my mission at UNESCO at that time was to follow what we were calling the international campaigns for the safeguarding of cultural heritage. But at this very moment, uh, it was a, a period of 10 years from 1980 to 1990, where uh, the executive board of UNESCO and the general conference considered that 
all these international campaigns were too many, and except the ones of Abu Simbel and Philae in Egypt and the one in Venice, the others are not having a very uh, uh, successful development. And that's why we didn't call Encore program as a campaign, but as a special project. So it is uh, important in, the, in this case to see uh, how uh, the Ecole Française d'Extrême Orient, uh, which is uh, one of the main scientific resources for the knowledge of uh, Encore, was immediately uh, uh, in, involved in the presentation, preparation of, of the project. Dr. Monir, if I may, if you want me to change the slides, just tell me. Yeah, I think the, the next sli slide is about, you know, uh, how, how we, we have some visions about, about Angkor. Uh, so uh, here I say that after this uh, the Paris Agreement, Norodom Sianouk la launched an appeal like it was done by the Egyptian uh, Minister of Culture in the 60s for the Abu Simbel. And really the international community was uh, mobilized to uh, fight against the uh, dangers uh, of the site. In his appeal, I, I, here I just uh, take one expert except, I am truly delighted and very honored to have been invited to address this remarkable gathering of experts on Angkor. And I would like at the outset to express my heartfelt thanks to His Excellency Don Federico Mayor Director General of, of UNESCO for extending me such an invitation. The Supreme, Council, so the Supreme National Council of Cambodia is profoundly grateful for all the efforts you, ladies and gentlemen, have undertaken to save the monuments of Angkor and Angkor Wat in particular, which are the heritage of the Cambodian people, but also the patrimony of humanity. It is not by chance that one of the first measures adopted by the Supreme Council of Cambodia as its first meeting after it became operational was to request the Secretary General of the United Nations to inscribe the monuments of Angkor in the UNESCO World Heritage List. On behalf of the Supreme National Council of Cambodia, I see, I continue to uh, to quote the, the king, uh, peace upon, upon him, he's not anymore in this uh, her, earth. On behalf of the Supreme National Council of Cambodia, I wish to encourage and even urge to continue your noble task, which will benefit not only to Cambodia, but the whole world. Now that peace has returned to Cambodia, you will have all the necessary facilities to continue research and preservation projects on site. Now we are concerned with the restoration and preservation of the monuments of Angkor. You all play an important role in this process. It is essential that measures be taken against vandalism, the illegal traffic of cultural relics of Angkor Wat, Angkor Thom, and other temples of the Angkorian period in Cambodia, which I repeat are the cultural heritage of the Khmer people, but also the patrimony of the world. This is an appeal which is dated 21st September 1991. And immediately after, uh, Federico Mayor undertook a mission to Cambodia and he asked me as director to follow up his visit in preparing with ECOMOS and with the experts from Ecole Française d'Extrême Orient and also from Sofia University with Professor Ishizawa, who is one of the leading experts in Japan for Cambodia history and archaeology, to, to, uh, to follow the process of the inscription. This was the second phase after this big appeal, the inscription of uh, Angkor on the World Heritage List. And you know, sometimes there are some good signs, let's say. Uh, uh, this a meeting of the World Heritage Committee in uh, December 1992 was held in Santa Fe in the United States. When at this period, like now, United States was not part of UNESCO. They left UNESCO uh, in 19, 
83-84 and but the committee uh, was organizing its committee in Santa Fe in uh, in the United States because uh, although leaving UNESCO as member states of UNESCO United States was still part of the uh, World Heritage Committee at that, at that at this period the committee was coming from its pro uh, pre pre uh, previous meeting in Tunis, where the president of the committee is one of our good friends, Professor Azedin Beshaouch, who was the director general of archaeology museums and sites in Tunisia. So he came to uh, Santa Fe and uh, it, his role was very important because, uh, of course, the uh, ECOMOS uh, presentation for the site of Cambodia was not a, a positive presentation for obvious reasons. Uh, the ECOMOS uh, rapporteur said, uh, you know, this site is absolutely extraordinary. It has an outstanding universal value, but it has no management plan. It has no boundaries. It has no budget. There is no administration. There is no legislation. So the committee was uh, very much concerned by uh, uh, the fact that the, the, the meeting was not really ready for the approval, but Federico Mayor came himself to uh, Santa Fe and during the night before the session, he called me and he said, Munir, it is very important that despite the difficult uh, situation of the country, we should do our efforts and I give you all uh, authorization to speak on my behalf and to explain to the committee that all the, uh, you know, um, measures that should be taken, yes, UNESCO will be uh, following them. So this is how uh, I was uh, following uh, since the inscription of the site because it was finally inscribed and it was inscribed in, in a way that happened later on. It was inscribed on the World Heritage List, but on, at the same session, on the, on, on the same, uh, at the same period, it was inscribed on the World Heritage List in danger. And this was giving, at the time, uh, with the approval of the, of the Cambodian authorities, it was, giving, giving, uh, it was giving to UNESCO the possibility to immediately start working with, uh, with uh, the colleagues in, in Cambodia and creating what was called at that time a special mechanism to the follow-up of uh, the site of Angkor that we called in a, uh, in a short name ICC, International Coordination Committee. How this committee was created? It was created in Tokyo in uh, uh, in 1993, and it was immediately put under a double uh, chairmanship. It is under the, the, the chair of Japan and the chair of France. And the, the Cambodian uh, Minister of Culture was the honorary uh, chair of this uh, International Coordination Committee. Of course, I cannot go in, into all the detail, but uh, this uh, committee was really the engine that was helping through donations, through contributions by many countries. Of course, the, the two first ones, France, Japan, but also United States, Germany, Italy, Indonesia, China, uh, Malaysia, Australia, many, many countries contributed, even Luxembourg. I remember I went to see uh, the Duchess of Luxembourg, who uh, gave, gave us a, a contribution to create inside the Angkor uh, 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 preservation site uh, a laboratory for uh, photographic uh, documentation. This uh, committee was meeting and is meeting two times a year. We call it the the first meeting in June is the technical committee. The second meeting in December is the, uh, the general uh, assembly of the committee where the ambassadors are present and we present, I mean UNESCO, 
created a small group of experts. We were four. I think there is a picture where we can see the expert plus Azedin Beshaouch, who was designated scientific secretary of this committee. And uh, of course, the uh, Minister of Culture always present. What was uh, uh, very important to see, and this I can speak as a, uh, I was present all this time from 1993 up to the last meeting, December 2019, because the last two years, unfortunately, because of the COVID, we, have, we had our meetings, we continued to work, but only in a virtual, virtual way. What is very important, and you see in one of the picture, the committee meeting in June and the committee meeting in December was always attended, not only by the Minister of Culture, but also by the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Sokan, who unfortunately died uh, last year. Uh, he was present with a number of ministers and high officials all the time since 1993. And the last meeting was in December uh, 2019, where Mrs. Azoulay was present. And she was absolutely uh, uh, surprised by the quality of the work, the quality of the uh, presentations by the Cambodians. Because during these 25 years, or now, now we can say even 27 years, we worked on the legislation. My colleague, Linda Prot, who was the head of the normative action at UNESCO, she, was, she is uh, now retired, but she was professor of international law. She worked and participated in Cambodia for the establishment of the law on heritage in Cambodia. We had specialists from uh, the World Bank, and I, I, I am I'm pleased to, to see uh, a colleague from the World Bank at that time I organized uh, an exhibition in the hall of the World Bank, inaugurated by uh, Federico Mayor, showing how much important is the contribution of the World Bank in the period of reconstruction and rehabilitation of heritage after period of war and crisis. Uh, it, after uh, after uh, the period where the site was followed by the highest level uh, in, in Cambodia, we have seen, of course, the de development of a university of fine arts where uh, training was done in, uh, for, for, for the people, for the, 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 the local people. And now we have a number of architects, engineers, uh, re restorers from Cambodia working with the international teams. We have also established the zoning and management planning. And now we have all the boundaries of this huge site because people are speaking about Angkor only in nominating, uh, uh, citing Angkor Wat. It's more than that. Uh, Angkor is hundreds of temples and a community living in the, in the, in the, in the forest and the environment of the temples. And these are Buddhist communities so what we did at Ikram, and in particular with my colleague Gamini uh, Vijay Surya, we organized training sessions for the, for the monks. And two years ago, we had a fantastic result. There, is, there was a, a temple of the uh, 11th century, and immediately besides the temple, there was a new uh, temple for, for, the, uh, for, for the monks. The monks decided when we explained that it is better to have the new building a, a bit far from the historic monuments, they accepted to, de to destroy the places where they were living and to build uh, 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 far away. Here in the picture, you can see uh, Professor Claude Jacques. He was one of the leading uh, expert, French expert in, uh, uh, in Cambodia. Uh, you see uh, uh, Professor Croci, you see the uh, uh, Cambodian uh, uh, director of uh, antiquities and heritage. So, and we are here, you can see we are in the field going to see temple by temple, see team by team what was done in, uh, in Cambodia. Dr. Moni, so, just to alert you, you just have more than one minute, a bit more than okay, a minute. So I want to conclude by this, I think this is another historical picture. Here you can see 
from uh, left to right. Professor uh, uh, from, from Versailles, <laughs> uh, he, he was the architect in charge of Versailles. You see me, you see Azedin Beshawush, Giorgio Croci, Professor Hidaka. These are, these are the people who were following technically the sites in, in Cambodia. And I think we can say that uh, uh, with the minister, the present minister of culture, Mrs. Mrs. Fong Sakona, that uh, the, uh, the successful project is having a concrete impact on the technical side, and it has a concrete impact on the well being for communities. Here you can see the picture with the, the, the son of the king. Uh, Sianuk Norodom. This is uh, Norodom Siamoni. He's in, uh, you know, on his right, he has Madame Azoulay. On his left, the minister, uh, Madame Sakona. And he was ambassador of Cambodia to UNESCO. So his presence at UNESCO during 10 years was very, uh, very useful uh, because we can see uh, that at, again at the highest level of Cambodia, there is a, a real as we say in France, in prise en charge, you know, there is a commitment by the highest authorities for the preservation of the site and for its development. And to conclude, before COVID in 2019, the Minister of Tourism of Cambodia, who organized with Madame Bokova uh, in uh, uh, 2014, a meeting between UNWTO, World Tourism Organization and UNESCO, an international seminar to show how Cambodia became one of the more, most popular uh, destination for tourism in, uh, in Asia. Thank you very much for your attention. Of course, I can develop much more, but I think I have really tried to show that in this case in particular, I cannot generalize, we will discuss later uh, with the, my colleagues, in this case, in particular, it was the, the political will from the top that helped the uh, rehabilitation and reconstruction uh, at the bottom. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, Amra, I, I, I'm, uh, and, and May, as a president of this uh, session, uh, I am always <laughs> speaking too much. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Munir, for this very insightful presentation and uh, for presenting the point of view of the importance of political win will and a very concrete example in that regard, actually. Uh, and also mentioning the International Coordination uh, Committee that was established that was really, that is considered as one of really the successful uh, coordination international committees uh, for World Heritage Sites. So thank you very much for this uh, presentation. The next uh, presentation uh, is about uh, Alif's experience in protecting heritage to build peace, the early lessons of Alif's efforts to protect heritage in conflict and post-conflict areas. Uh, the presentation, as mentioned, is by Mr. Valérie Fleurin, the director, executive director of uh, the International Alliance for the Protection of Heritage in Conflict Areas, ELIF, Ms. Alexandra Fibic, project manager, and Mr. Andrea Balbio, uh, project manager. Uh, Valérie Fleurin has been the executive director of ELIF in Geneva since the 1st of September in 2018, where he is responsible for strategic implementation and management. A French career diplomat, he holds a law degree from Pantheon Sorbonne University and is a graduate of Science Po in Paris, as well as the Ecole Nationale d'Administration uh, in France. He, be he began his career as a legal advisor at the Superior Council of the Audiovisual between 1994 and 1997, before joining the French Foreign Ministry, where he dealt with multilateral uh, audiovisual uh, negotiations. After graduating from the Ecole Nationale d'Administration in 2004, he joined the Quai d'Orsay, where he successfully had the positions of senior officer at the Division of the European Union in charge of the EU budget, culture and audiovisual advisor at the permanent representation of France to the European Union in Brussels during the French presidency of the EU, 
uh, deputy director in charge of audiovisual and communication technologies in 2019, diplomatic advisor to the French Minister of Culture and Communication, Frédéric Mitterrand between 2009 and 2010, uh, cooperation and cultural advisor at the French Embassy in Tunisia between uh, 2010 and 2013, and finally as deputy director of cultural universities and research, and research at the Quai d'Orsay between 2013 and 2015. Before joining Alif, he, he served as consul general of France in Boston between 2015 and 2018. He is a Chevalier of the French Order of Arts and Letters, and he received it in 2010. Alexandra Fiebig joined Alif in March uh, 2019 as project manager. As part of the small Alif team, Alexandra monitors a wide range of rehabilitation and conservation uh, projects in Afghanistan, North uh, East Syria, Iraq, and Georgia. And she follows up on Alif's emergency re relief mechanism. Her professional interests include increasing support from international funders to local organizations from conflict and post-conflict areas. Before joining Alif, she worked for nine years at the UNESCO World Heritage Center. Alexandra has a master's in arts and heritage management from Maastricht University and one and one another master's in modern his, history and languages uh, from Oxford. Uh, Mr. Andy Abalbo uh, uh, joined Alif in 2018 after 25 years in the cultural heritage sector. His core interests include linkages between climate change, conflict and cultural heritage and documentation, and ICT for cultural heritage protection. He has a degree in cultural heritage conservation from the University of Bologna, a master's in environment and archeology span from the Sorbonne, and a PhD in archeology span from Cambridge. He is an alumnus at Darwin College, Cambridge, the Newton European Youth Trust, the Marie Skodowska Curie Association, and the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung uh, Foundation. He has conducted research at, Spanish National, uh, at, at the Spanish National Research Council and at the University of Hamburg, studying environmental landscape, trans landscape transport transformations from the Neolithic to the Islamic periods in the Mediterranean and MENA region, as well as in Oman, Northwest India, Norway, and Tierra del Fuego. He's an accredited assistant professor with the Italian Ministry of Universities and Research, Andrea lectures at university level in archaeology, heritage conservation, and human environment interaction. He acts as an evaluator, rapporteur, and monitor for the European Commission. Alexandra, you have the floor, <laughs> please, on behalf of Alif. Thank you. Thank you very much, my chair, and thank you for the introductions. I will share my screen with you. Let's go. Is it looks like it's set up? Yes. Okay, I can see not. Well, thank you very much, my share, for the introduction. Thank you very much for the organizers to invite us to this conference and also to contribute to the uh, upcoming book on the important subject of reconstruction and post-traumatic environments. We're very much looking forward uh, to the book uh, on this important subject. Uh, it is highly relevant to the daily work of the foundation that I work, with, work for and for all the partners that we work with. Uh, the presentations that I managed to see so far have been very, very rich and they provide a lot of food for thought, how we can improve our daily work at the foundation and how we can meaningfully for better fulfill our mission to protect heritage, to build peace. Um, I will be presenting um, an article, the article on Alif's experience in protecting heritage to build peace. Uh, it has been co-written uh, with uh, Valérie Frelon and um, my colleague, who's Valérie Frelon, the, our director, and my colleague, Andrea Balbo. Thank you for the introductions uh, on each one of them. And um, we all work at the International Alliance for the Protection of Cultural Heritage in Conflict and Post-Conflict Area, also more widely known as ALIF. 
uh, Alif was founded in 2017 on the initiative of France and the United Arab Emirates, and we established offices in Geneva in late 2018. This is why the subtitle of our article is called The Early Lessons of Alif's Efforts to Protect Heritage in Conflict Areas. And I would like to say a few words about Alif before. So Alif is the only international fund that is exclusively dedicated to the protection of cultural heritage in conflict and post-conflict areas. We are a private foundation under Swiss law, which gives us agility. And we're also recognized as an international organization based in Geneva, um, which provides us with privileges and immunities. And our modus operando reference model is the Global Fund Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. We are a public-private partnership. We have seven member states, three private donors, and uh, we are hosted generously by Switzerland. So in essence, we are a financial instrument. We provide grants to heritage protection initiatives. And we are also a scientific expertise uh, via the Secretariat, the Scientific Committee that is chaired by Jean-Luc Martinez, and we have many other uh, wonderful members uh, of the scientific committee, including Dr. Monir Bushnaki, who has been who has just been talked, and we're very grateful for their support uh, through the foundation board and through our network of more than 200 international and local experts. And I think, in some ways, this alliance between uh, countries such as France, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Luxembourg, and China, as well as the uh, our private partners and this network of uh, experts. In some ways, we 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 contribute to this global response to the challenge of reconstruction in post-conflict areas. We work uh, in a startup mindset. We're a small team, uh, soon to be 12 uh, based in Geneva at the Secretariat. And we try to fulfill our work with dynamism, in, dynamism, innovation, and to be as responsive as possible without compromising quality and rigor in our work. We currently fund over 110 projects in 22 countries. We have committed uh, 45 million of funds to the protection of intangible heritage, monuments and sites, documentation, interconnection of heritage, and the safeguarding of museums and their collection. Alif was founded with the objective of preventing the massive destruction of cultural heritage witnessed in the Sahel in the Middle East of the last 10 10 years. Cultural heritage has long been the target of war as it is one of the most visible expressions of identities. Its destruction can be a weapon of war when we think of the videos, for example, that has, have been disseminated by the terrorist groups uh, in Mosul and in Hatra in Iraq. Or cultural heritage can be the collateral victim of the fight against terrorism. So our article is based on our initial experience in supporting such heritage affected by conflict in close cooperation with international and local heritage organizations, local and national political, administrative and religious authorities, as well as the peoples and communities that live in and around the heritage or practice it. In preparation of this article, Alif has sent out a questionnaire to 10 organizations working on the ground on heritage protection projects funded by Alif in Afghanistan, Cote d'Ivoire, Iraq, Mali, and Northeast Syria. The findings that we present, they do not have the ambition of being exhaustive nor scientifically object, objective. They were meant as a 
they're meant as a contribution to the common issues we are confronted with in working in this challenging field. At Alif, we work under the premises that cultural heritage is one, a means of economic and social development. All Alif funded projects generate a number of local jobs which engage and retain local expertise and workforce and stimulate the local economy to sustainable development. We, um, through, for example, through a preference for traditional and locally sourced materials and environmental sensitivity. And three, uh, as a means for resilience and peace building. We approach heritage as places of memories, dialogue, and as local anchorage for communities affected by conflict. For us, heritage protection can thus make an important symbolic and material contribution to recovery in post-conflict contexts. Over the past three years, we identified a number of recurrent challenges when working on heritage in conflict and post-conflict areas. The first one, cultural heritage is a political issue. Uh, Dr. Munia Bushnaki already eloquently talked about the need for political will at the highest level. Um, and Alif, as an international organization, abides as per our bylaws with the principle of state sovereignty as a cornerstone of international relations. This throws up a set of challenges, such as how to conciliate the need to protect heritage with the principles of sovereignty, for example, in fragmented countries such as Syria. And of course, this question has come to the forefront uh, over the summer in Afghanistan, for example. Heritage protection or reconstruction projects need the approval of competent local or national authorities. However, beyond the formal approval, an active support is essential, not least to counter bureaucratic hurdles, Local co-creation of heritage initiative, as well as advocacy and awareness raising are critical for the success of protection of heritage and all its diversity in post-conflict areas. Secondly, security is of utmost priority when intervening uh, in conflict and post-conflict areas. Additional security mechanisms have to be put in place for project teams to access sites such as HAT such as uh, in Hatra, for example, in Iraq. Clearance and demining protocols have to be adapted to not, not to harm persons, as well as cause no damage to the heritage to be safeguarded. All the projects supported in Mosul, for example, have to incorporate such a complex and crucial expertise. Instable security conditions can complicate the procurement of restoration materials as we experience uh, at the Sankor Mosque Al Akib Library manuscript preservation project led by Amalia in the Timbuktu area, or during the restoration of the Museum of Raqqa, which you can see in the background here, uh, in Northeast area, Syria, led by La Guilde Européenne du Red in cooperation with the local Syrian NGO Ruya. Finding the right balance, the third point, between international and local actors. Alif always works in partnership with people and institutions on the ground. Yet our experiences taught us that in a post-war recovery, external expertise is often necessary, at least in the beginning. This is particularly true for countries where prolonged conflict has affected the educational system and has caused local a brain drain of local expertise. We try to ensure, however, that this initial reliance on external expertise does not create a dependence. We ask that all projects are carried out with local partner institutions and that there is a transfer of skills so that the local institutions and organizations uh, gradually can run the projects and initiatives on their own. Finally, as already briefly mentioned, we ensure that every project we fund gives employment to local people at all levels of expertise and uh, that it provides on the job training, allowing 
allowing the development of skill sets. The fourth challenge that we identified is the need to coordinate and break down the barriers between sectors and actors, between heritage and defense, diplomacy, development and humanitarian aid and civil society. As noted several times during the conference, working in post-conflict reconstruction requires a transversal set of skills and expertise. And this is why ALIF partners with a wide variety of organizations from various sect sectors. For example, in the Sinjar region in Iraq, we have partnered with the Nadia Murad Initiative for the reconstruction of the Yazidi temples. In Northeast Syria, we have partnered with the Geneva-based human rights organization Fight for Humanity. Looking a little bit further ahead, uh, we also wanted to note uh, some new or newish ch challenges that will affect our work in the, uh, in the coming years. The first one is uh, related to the climate change on the forefront at the moment. The International Red Cross report when, turn, when rain turns to dust demonstrates that many countries most affected by climate, climate change are also in conflict. Of the 20 or so countries that are most exposed to climate change, 12 are in the Middle East, South Asia and Africa, including five, five in the Horn of Africa. Linking therefore climate change, conflict and heritage conservation in these regions and in many others, heritage conservation can mitigate the effects of climate change and the likelihood of conflict, particularly by providing alternative employment and income in communities with strong rural identities. Additionally, the use of local building materials and methods contributes to the sustainability of heritage conservation activities. In particular, this favors the development of local distribution channels job creation, the maintenance of local knowledge and skills, and economic independence. This is why Alif has decided to finance projects to preserve craft skills uh, in various countries, including Afghanistan, or earthen architecture uh, courses organized by the Getty Conservation Institute. A concrete example of such practices um, is provided by the Tomb of Askia restoration project in Mali, which uses traditional plastering and techniques and local materials such as clay and hassle wood. The, our project includes a tree nursery component to guarantee the long-term provision of wood for maintenance and conservation. The second big challenge uh, for all of us uh, is the long-term impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has and continues to have an impact on all our lives and the wider sector. In response to the initial suspension of many activities in our sector, we launched at Aliv a COVID-19 action plan last year. This plan provided support to some 100 local heritage organizations in 37 conflict, post-conflict and vulnerable countries, allowing them to weather the first month of the global coronavirus per, per, pandemic. We also supported some digital resources such as the Alif e-learning repository and three self-help video resources together with the ECROM First Aid for Culture program on protection, livelihood and virtual access of cultural heritage in times of COVID-19 crisis. As we continue to deal with the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in all corners from the world, international advocacy in support of the protection of cultural heritage as an integral part of post-conflict, post-traumatic recovery is essential. We are therefore very grateful for the UNESCO Regional Arab Center for World Heritage for this initiative and for the organization of this conference. I would like to close by thanking the organizers and in particular, Dr. Amra 
Hadzi Mohamedovic for her precious work over the past year, as well as Mohamed Zian and the rest of the RWH team, team for the wonderful organization. Alif's contribution of heritage and reconstruction in post-conflict recovery relies on the strength of the partners and organizations that work on a day-to-day -day basis in challenging environments. We are honored to support them and we are very grateful for their work. And this is why I would like to close my presentations with a few pictures from these organizations of some of the Alif funded projects. Um, one of our first projects in Iraq um, at the Mar Benam Monastery led by the Fraternité Iraq, uh, where we rehabilitated the monastery to become again uh, a place for pilgrimage of Christian, Muslim and Yazidi communities. Uh, this is our work in Iraq and Mosul. Um, the Louvre, the Smithsonian and the World Monuments Fund work together on the rehabilitation of the, it's on the big project uh, on the Mosul Museum. And on the right hand side, you can see the Tutunji House uh, led by Penn University and the Engineering uh, Bureau of Mosul. Muse Mosul University. In Côte d'Ivoire, we supported the Musée des Civilisations in Abidjan, uh, who had been uh, that had been looted in 2011 uh, following unrest during um, during an election period, and uh, we helped with uh, strengthening security measures. At the, at the museum. In Mali, I already mentioned the manuscripts of Timbuktu project led by Amalia and the Tomb of Askia project. Um, in Sudan, we have a wide range of projects that work on archives, archaeological archeologi sites, and community museums. And I think just the latest news, they show how volatile uh, security, the, the security situations can become and how quickly it can have impacts on, on, on projects um, and how much resilience and uh, these projects need to continue. In Yemen, uh, we support the Damar Museum and the Thais National Museum together with the World Monument Fund. Um, and then, of course, this, our project in Afghanistan, where we all hold our breath to see how we can continue to, uh, to support uh, the heritage protection initiatives that are there. And if this, I think the pictures do not give enough. Um, they don't. Uh, they don't give enough justice for all the work. If you would like to find out more, uh, we invite you to look at our videos. Uh, there are many more than Hatra and Raqqa, many stories in Arabic, English, and French. And please visit them to find out more. Initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. A very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, thank you for also presenting the challenges uh, that you have encountered uh, during the past years and uh, through the projects in the different uh, uh, areas and sites and contexts, and also for talking about the new and emerging uh, challenges. So thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation. Now we move on to the third presentation uh, that has been uh, prepared by Ms. Magdalena Marcinkowska. And it is about recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage, the socioeconomic approach. 
Magdalena Marcinkowska is an expert in cultural heritage protection. She is a member of ECOMOS and ELA Poland and is the author and editor of numerous publications on cultural heritage law, including the 2019 publication on the challenges of world heritage recovery. In 2018-2020, she was deputy director of the Monuments Preservation Department at the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage of the Republic of Poland. She is currently the permanent delegate of the Republic of Poland uh, to UNESCO. Uh, unfortunately, she is not here with us, but I believe Mr. Mohamed Bouzian would be able to uh, make a short presentation yes. on her behalf. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I will share her presentation, but my colleague Salma Qasim will be reading her script. Good afternoon, esteemed colleagues. Today, I have the honor to present to you the relevant presentation on the topic of recovery, reconstruction of cultural heritage with a focus on socioeconomic um, approach. First of all, I would like, um, I, will, I, I will start reading the presentation now as it was um, handed in by uh, the author. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Shadia Tukhan. No, Mohammed, please, uh, slide before, please. Keep it there, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Shadia Tukhan previous director of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage, and Dr. Amra Hadzi Mohamedovic for the cordial invitation to the conference. I have to say that I'm personally extremely sad that you all couldn't meet in Manama and Bahrain. I have visited the center myself in 2018, and I was very impressed by the work that you're doing there. Before I start, did you know that Manama is very close to Warsaw. I'll tell you why at the end of my speech. The task I have been signed up to by Dr. Amra, not an easy one. It's not an easy one, is to show the socioeconomic approach to recovery and reconstruction in the doctrinal documents and policy strategies and how that is all linked to the Warsaw recommendation. Rapid urbanization, increasing dis disasters or evolving conflicts are the factors that define our today's world according to the CURE framework, culture in city, reconstruction and recovery. Apologies for the uh, interruption. We had some technical issues with the translation. I continue. So rapid urbanization, increasing disasters. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Avar, um, it is only my microphone and your microphone that is open. Can you hear us now loud and clear? Thank you. Apologies to our audience for this technical issue. I uh, resume the presentation. Rapid urbanization, increasing disasters or evolving conflicts are the factors that define our today's world according to the CURE framework. Culture in city reconstruction and recovery, prepared by UNESCO and the World Bank in 2018. Disasters will cost cities across the globe, I quote, some 314 billion US dollars in annual damage and losses by 2030. At the same time, contemporary armed conflicts are growing become more complex, involve new actors, and constantly bring havoc and destruction to cultural heritage. 
around the world today, according to the statistics prepared by UNHCR, as a result of armed conflicts, 68 point million people are affected by this displacement and 19.9 million of these are refugees. The factors determine the need to rethink what are the socioeconomic aspects of cultural heritage, reconstruction, and why they are important. Next slide, please. Socioeconomic aspects of cultural heritage recovery and reconstruction appear rather rarely in conservation legal acts. However, you may find some relevance of the importance of socioeconomic factors in several ICMOS charters. The most important one for our topic today is the Australian Borough Charter for the conservation of places of cultural significance and the Washington Charter. The first one strictly represents a place-based approach, but in the sense of the meaning that the site has to the community. It introduces the so-called Bura Charter process in which the people-centered approach and social factors of the process of conservation and reconstruction had been emphasizing active social participation of people, Article 12. The second, the Washington Charter, enumerated the major principle of directly mentioning the socio-economical aspects of the conservation and restoration, indicating the importance of the involvement of the coherent policies of economic and social development. It presents how important the social, socio-economic aspect had become when it comes to the process of conservation of the immovable heritage and how deeply it affects the coherent policies like urban policies, regional planning, social and economic development of the city. While the concept of conservation of cultural heritage has been presented in the Riga Charter on Authenticity and Historical Reconstruction in relationship to cultural heritage. Its main purpose was to address the political need to establish ground rules con uh, reconstruction, which have become a particular concern since they were caused by the number of urban developments, especially in countries which recently gained the independence. The, the charter stresses the reconstruction is acceptable under exceptional circumstances, but underlines as well that the process of reconstruction needs to be carried out, I quote, without conjecture or compromising existing in situ remains, unquote. When we revive the content of the Riga Charter, it shows that, like in the Bura Charter, the most important element of reconstruction was the socio impact. I quote, the need for reconstruction has to be established through full and open consultation among national and local authorities and the community concerned, as in paragraph six, as par paragraph six stipulates. Moreover, all stakeholders involved in the process of rec uh, recovery, such as governments and the and administrations were recommended to introduce at the level of national and local policies and practices and all concerned academic institutions should include in it in their training programs. Paragraph seven. The last soft law document I would like to mention today is the UNESCO recommendation on historic urban landscapes. Although it didn't refer directly to the recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage, the recommendation mentions in its provisions that changes to historic urban areas can also result from post-crisis situations. To remedy them, they introduced a historic urban landscape approach. I quote, may assist in managing and mitigating the effects of such impacts. 
In this approach, the socioeconomic aspects have been underlined by bringing the goals of heritage conservation and those of soci social and economic development closer together. The people-centered approach is emphasized in paragraph 13 by stressing that the newly established historic urban landscape approach gains experience from the traditions and perceptions of local communities without prejudice to the values of the national and international communities. Undoubtedly, the Hull recommendation of a soft law introduced a um, holistic approach to the future management and preser preservation of historic cities. The broader urban context of cultural heritage protection was was an answer to the needs of the modern societies and challenges like urbanization, globalization, and the world's growing e economy, but also rapid socioeconomic changes. Next slide, please. Socioeconomic aspects of recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage have strict connections to resilience and sustainability and disaster risk reduction strategies. At the global level, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction. <clears throat> Although the socioeconomic aspects of the recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage are not directly indicated in both of the documents, they refer several times to the importance of cultural heritage protection and especially the Sendai framework, we have we find references to cultural heritage and its value, both in the process of risk preparedness and post-disaster recovery, reconstruction and rehabilitation. It advocates to the concept of build back better by providing the participation of the local communities and indigenous people in the process of implementing plans and mechanisms in every stage of the risk management process. One of the main conservation policy making documents mentioning the socioeconomic aspects of cultural heritage, recovery and reconstruction is the e-commerce guidance on post-trauma recovery and reconstruction for World Heritage Cultural Properties, which was specifically addressed to sites having outstanding universal value. The paper published in 2017 acknowledges the wider social, environmental, and economic factors that must be initiated in the process of recovery and reconstruction. Recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage is mostly strictly connected to recovery and reconstruction of the cities destroyed after disasters resulting from natural hazards or armed conflict. The acknowledgement of the importance of cultural heritage in the process became a milestone step towards the pre preparedness of the policymaking instruments. The involvement and cooperation between UNESCO and UNISDR and the World Bank brought new recommendations and guidance for policymakers, investors, and stakeholders to help build back better after the tragedy of the destroyed cultural heritage. <clears throat> in 2018, the World Bank, in cooperation with UNESCO, prepared a position paper entitled culture and city, reconstruction and recovery, to step up guidance for all stakeholders involved in the process. In this document, culture in its all forms was presented as an effective tool in the recovery and reconstruction policy programs and programs. The socioeconomic aspects were described emphasizing that the people center approach is a core element when it comes to the recovery and reconstruction of cities. This document indicated that the importance of the people centered approach is as crucial as the place based approach, which has been recalled 
previously in, um, in conservation policy instruments. We do not have much time to talk about them now in a more specific way. However, what it is worth mentioning is that it introduces the 3P approach as an answer to the challenges of the city recovery and reconstruction, putting culture as a main element of, to the process. Next slide, please. Also from World Heritage List to the World Heritage Recommendation. There are many examples of a successful reconstruction of cities and its heritage, but there is only one which has been recognized in 1980 as a site without, with, without any universal value. And that is the historic center of Warsaw. In the justification of its inscription on the World Heritage List, one may read that it is, I quote, an example illustrating the effectiveness of conservation activities in the second half of the 20th century, which permitted the integral reconstruction of the complex urban ensemble, unquote. Totally destroyed by Nazi German troops in 1944, it had been reconstructed by a conservation program which resulted in the creation of, unique, uh, of a unique urban space. But most importantly, it has a symbolic dimension as an invincible city. In case of Warsaw, the socioeconomic factor of the reconstruction of cultural heritage was so feasible and present that the ECOMAS evaluation emphasized in its final report by recalling that, I quote, between 1945 and 1966, the will of nation brought to life again in a city which was in 85% destroyed. The reconstruction unique and outstanding had started as many, um, as many at the time right after the World War II without any guidance or international conservation soft law instruments. It was orchestrated by the Warsaw Conservation Authorities with a carefully prepared plan of the recovery of the city and with an aim not only to rebuild monuments in the material sense, but also to revitalize the living environment of the local community in their familiar context. This was back then between the late 40s and 60s, what we recognize today as a socioeconomic approach to recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage. Decades later, this unique type of also reconstruction was recalled again in recognition of the heroism and dedication of the Polish society, which has rebuilt its capital city. Being symbolic for other cities affected by the tra tragedy of disasters resulting from natural ha hazards or conflicts, it also gave ground for the Warsaw recommendation on recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage. In this document, a comprehensive set of principles concerning the, the process of urban recovery and reconstruction of historic buildings or complexes of buildings was introduced. The provisions of the Warsaw recommendations were subsequently approved in the decision of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee at its 42 session in Manama, Bahrain. Now you see why Manama is very close to Warsaw. Very recently, the document has been translated into Arabic, for which I wish to thank once again Director Zaki Aslan from Ikram Charja. And coming back to WR, among the non binding principles, the socio economic aspects of recovery and reconstruction has been underlined by strongly recommending a people centered approach in the decision making process on recovery and reconstruction 
which should fully engage local communities, as well as indigenous people and other relevant stakeholders. Moreover, the Warsaw recommendation states very clearly that the process of recovery and reconstruction, I quote, should enable people to connect to their heritage, identity, and history, unquote. For the first time, the cultural rights were mentioned as an important element in every re reconstruction program. Next slide, please. Conclusion. The socioeconomic approach of, of the rec recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage became more visible than ever showing that not only the place-based approach in its complicated process is essential. Although the recovery and reconstruction in the conservation doctrine has long been considered as a threat to world heritage, especially to the concept of authenticity and integrity. Recent developments, however, for instance, cases like Timbuktu, historic tombs in Mali, clearly show the, that conservation policy evolved in time and the other aspects may also play an important role in the post-crisis situations when it comes to recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage. All reconstruction programs launched around the world, just to mention the UNESCO flagship initiative, I call Revive the Spirit of Mosul, as well as recovery actions undertaken in Syria or Nepal, show that the socioeconomic approach in recovery and reconstruction of cultural heritage is crucial. It brings not only social cohesion and resilience, but also moral support and help to people by allowing them to be part of the revival process. As the Warsaw example presents very vividly, by restoring objects, people effectively restore their community's dignity and rebuild their culture, cultural and national identity. Next slide, please. For those who are interested in those two publications mentioned, please find the links on the slide. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Selma, for delivering the presentation on behalf of Magdalena. Thank you very much. So we uh, move on now to the fourth and uh, final uh, presentation of, of this uh, morning, uh, which will be presented by Mr. Ali Dost Ertugrul, uh, who is the head of the, architect, uh, of the architectural heritage department of IRSICA. Uh, IRSICA is the research center for Islamic history, art, and culture of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Mr. Ali Dost Ertugrul holds a bachelor degree from Yildiz University, Technical University's Faculty of Architecture, followed by a master's degree in architectural history and a doctorate. Uh, both at the Department of Conservation and Restoration of the Faculty of Architecture of uh, Istanbul Technical University. He has participated in conservation projects and activities at both private and public institutions and is a member of the Council for the Protection of Cultural Property of the Turkish Ministry of Culture and Tourism. After taking his doctorate, he pursued his academic uh, career teaching undergraduate and graduate courses and taking part in various research and publication projects at both public and privately owned endowed universities. His areas of interest include urban history, urban conservation, heritage management, and traditional construction techniques and materials. Mr. Ertugrol was appointed head of IRSICA uh, Architectural Heritage Department in August 2021, where he and his team work on projects for the preservation of cultural heritage in the Islamic world. His presentation today is about the approaches of IRSICA to integrated heritage reconstruction in a social post-trauma recovery. 
Mr. Etubro, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind presentation. Uh, just a minute, I will share the presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I respectfully greet uh, all the participants. Uh, I'm uh, honored to be among you. Uh, IRSCA, the cultural subsidiary center of the Organization of Islam Cooperation, OIC, has been working on the uh, history, arts, and cultures of Islamic world for more than 40 years. Uh, in this context, uh, IRSCA assumed the task of recording and contributing to the preservation of Islamic architectural heritage uh, located in its uh, 57 uh, member states. To this aim, IRSCA carried out studies for preservation of structures, uh, monuments, and urban areas in Islamic countries. Uh, changing times, uh, unfortunately, brought new crises and difficulties. Uh, local and uh, local or regional uh, conflicts of concern to OIC member states have caused losses or damage. All kinds of cultural heritage assets dating from different periods of history. Uh, attacks on tangible heritage and attempts to erase memories embodied in all kinds of heritage have been increasingly used as weapons of destruction during conflicts in many countries, including uh, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Kashmir, Afghanistan, and Azerbaijan, Karabakh. One of the issues as problematic as the conflict itself is the failure to foresee and uh, prevent the damage on heritage assets. Another one is the failure to manage the process uh, with an integrated approach that will take into account uh, socioeconomic factors and social participation in the post-conflict post reconstruction and recovery phase uh, together with the readily visible indicators. Uh, as is the case uh, in any preservation effort, uh, action taken regardless of all relevant factors uh, and inputs uh, involved in any process will result in losses of information and hinder efficiency. Uh, this presentation will emphasize uh, these and other issues taken uh, into consideration uh, in the context of previous and future projects of IRSICA uh, relating post-trauma heritage reconstruction uh, and uh, recovery. Uh, I will outline the experience of IRSICA with respect to these issues and describe its plans for future. Uh, IRSICA's Architectural Heritage Department carries out a wide variety of activities from locating and recording of heritage assets to preservation of structures. It organizes international research projects, workshops, seasonal architecture schools, academic congress, uh, exhibitions, and publishes the results of the, its activities. Uh, projects initiated by IRSICA are directed to preservation and transmission of architectural heritage and also improvement of life quality in urban environments. In this con connection, our center uh, endeavors to strengthen public consciousness and take leading international initiatives to protect all kinds of cultural heritage in the Islamic world from natural calamities and uh, human-made the wearing of time. Uh, the geographical area of Islamic countries is the historical cradle of Islamic culture and civilization. At the same time, it houses the cultural heritage of many earlier and present cultures and the vestiges of several deep-rooted civilizations. Therefore, a sound approach to the issue of preservation of cultural heritage in the Islamic geography would take into consideration the entire cultural heritage spread over this area regardless of its cultural identity. 
This comprehensive approach would help us serve and defend our cause to uh, protect the common heritage of humankind in a sound and strong manner. As is known, one of the most problematic issues with regard to sustainability of heritage is human made destruction, uh, harmful uses, inappropriate repairs, deliberate attacks, and destruction during wars and conflicts have been detrimental uh, and continue to be so. With the respect, uh, with respect not to only the Islamic but the entire cultural heritage of humanity. In this spirit, uh, IRSCA carries out permanent projects to locate, assess, and inventory the heritage properties of the Islamic world uh, at all times, independently from complex situations. At the same time, it diverts special attention to the issue of post-conflict uh, restoration and recovery. The major pro project of IRSICA consisting of the Islamic Architectural Heritage Database will be uh, carried on with constant revisions and expansions. Uh, looking at the past experience of IRSICA, one of the most important achievements was the series of architectural studies and annual architectural workshops held during and after the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The program involved practical and educational projects implemented jointly with international organizations and local authorities, authorities to rehabilitate urban and architectural heritage in war striking regions. It gave multifarious outcomes, including plans and recommendations on the following aspects of the post-conflict recovery. Uh, I can show, uh, now you can see the uh, materials uh, prepared during the Mostar 2004 project. Assessing the problems and issues, suggesting solutions with alternatives, establishing international cooperation, and listing participation of local actors and the users, among others. IRSCA also organized international academic conferences to secure funding for restorations on monuments and public structures. In this way, the center had to, had to strengthen awareness in world opinion and keep the memory of the history of Bosnia and Herzegovina always present, uh, present in public concessions as well as the architectural structures. In this way, the center had to strengthen awareness. This program was given the title of Mostar 2004 with the hope that it will be completed simultaneously with reopening of most are old bridge in 2004 in peaceful times. The workshops and studio projects address the issues of study, restoration, conservation of cities and buildings. These activities brought together a large number of professionals and students from various countries thus forming a network of people and institutions contributing to the preservation of heritage. Uh, the following main components of program will show overall the integrated approaches adopted by IRSICA, uh, promotion, education, training, uh, planning and guidelines of recovery, rehabilitation of the historic neighborhoods, restoration of prior to buildings, rehabilitation of the old bridge in Mostar. One of the most important vectors of success of the program was the participation and joint effort of professional architects, preservation specialists, together with both international and local administrators and donors. You can see the pictures of the uh, projects and uh, restorations also donations 
with the help of donations. In our future activities, we will maintain this integral approach and continue to give importance to building a promising general and overall environment for the preservation project uh, we will undertake. Uh, another uh, noteworthy uh, type of HCC uh, undertakes its collaboration with international organizations. HCC, uh, in its capacity as the intergovernmental organization of uh, 57 states, gives importance to cooperating with other international organizations that are concerned with heritage preservation. Uh, an example to this type of activity is the workshop on cultural heritage in Syria, which was organized by IRSICA and UNESCO in 2014 at IRSICA. The workshop focused on the destruction of monuments of Islamic heritage in Syria, uh, particularly in Damascus and Aleppo. It discussed on a possible restoration strategy to be implemented as soon as uh, the war uh, in Syria ends. Another example uh, for cooperation with the organization is the framework agreement signed between ISCA and the International Center for the Study of the Preservation Restoration of Cultural Property, ICROM, through the ICROM Atar uh, Center in Sar Sharjah. Uh, an important element for the success of any such effort is certainly sharing of information and experiences between organizations, uh, authorities and institutions. In the coming period, our center will give, give further importance to offering international platforms for exchange of best practices between all parties involved. The International Conference on Protection of Cultural Heritage of the Muslim World, organized by IRSICA, uh, together with the uh, Secretariat of OIC, the Islamic uh, uh, World Scientific Educational and Cultural Organization, uh, all you know, ISESCO, brought together architectural scholars, project managers, and representatives of Organizations, and organizations from around the world. They shared information on ongoing projects and related experiences. Uh, our center plans to reinstall such highly useful platforms of exchange. Presently, ISCA works together with the OIC General Secretariat towards establishment of the OIC platform for pres preservation of cultural heritage. We believe our experiences in the study and preservation of cultural and architectural heritage, focusing on the different regions of Islamic geography, will provide valuable inputs and references for the OIC platform. Wars and conf the, the conf conflicts in various regions of the world continue to cause countless valuable assets to disappear. Protection of human life is no doubt the foremost concern. Another sad outcome is uh, outcome of conflict is disappearance of the intellectual and cultural product of human existence, past and the present. Especially with regard to the physical protection of historical and archaeological sites to ensure their security from theft and of theft or looting. The wars in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, and Karabakh, uh, to cite examples from recent history, were not confined to ordinary pow power or conquest battles, but also carried aggressions against cultural identities and shared historical memories. Wars aiming cultural destruction, destruction have been one of the biggest threats of hum human survival mm. uh, at all times. Considering these facts and factors, the crucial importance of assessing, uh, recording and preserving all cultural assets as a continual task of peaceful time is seen clearly. 
this will help the success of any post-conflict reconstruction and recovery effort. We all know from experience that the following topics should be handled carefully during the reconstruction and the recovery of post-traumatic heritage, uh, diversity and human rights, identity and experiences, memory and remembrance, sustainability, public awareness and participation. Uh, I wish to conclude uh, by reaffirming Isikar's readiness to share his experiences and cooperate with parties engaged in heritage preservation projects in pre and post conflict periods. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your organ. Uh, thanks for this uh, conf organizing this uh, conference. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ali Dost, uh, for your presentation and for uh, highlighting the importance of uh, taking into account uh, social economic factors and uh, social participation and uh, for presenting uh, the work uh, that you have carried out uh, through IRSICA. So uh, I thank all four presenters now, and uh, we move on to the last part of uh, the morning session, which is uh, about uh, um, reflections by uh, three uh, esteemed colleagues and panelists, uh, Mr. Ahmed Oweida, Ms. Zainab Gulunal, and Ms. Sinada Habibijo. Uh, I will ask each panelist a question uh, focusing on their expertise and personal experience related to the topic of uh, today's session. And uh, I will start with uh, Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed, you are the, the World Bank Global Coordinator for Cultural Heritage and Sustainable Tourism. And you have co-authored the UNESCO World Bank position paper on culture in city recovery and reconstruction. Uh, dubbed as a cure, the cure approach, and which has been mentioned uh, <laughs> throughout today and, and probably uh, previously as well. So can you please tell us more about the proposed uh, cure framework and how it can contribute to addressing some of the challenges of integrated reconstruction of heritage in post-trauma recovery? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks also for the organizers and Manama for this opportunity to give me the floor to reflect. Uh, it's very little to say after this very powerful presentations made today by all presenters, but I was uh, honored that to be the task team leader with the UNESCO colleague uh, Lazar and co-author of this uh, position paper with UNESCO together with Dr. Amra, who was also a co-author of this position paper called Culture and City Reconstruction and Recovery or Cure. And as you rightly said, uh, in this framework, perhaps it builds on so many other previous frameworks uh, that Magdalena mentioned, but uh, what's really very special or important about it, it adopts, it places people and their cultures at the heart of the post-crisis uh, recovery and reconstruction process. So it is in a way a reverse, a reverse engineering approach where you know, we, we have seen in all recent crises, you know, engineers and economists come very quickly do PDNA or uh, post-conflict peace building and you go to the numbers of losses and, uh, and uh, damages. Uh, and then engineers go quickly with water pipes and reconstruction of buildings and we forget what really matters, people and the trauma they went through. So this topic of the conference is extremely important and the CURE framework is specifically to address this issue of post-conflict, post-disaster trauma. I used the, we used in the framework uh, word post-crisis to refer to three types of crises. Uh, Post-natural uh, disasters, those are hurricane, tornado, earthquakes, which damage large parts of the historic core of the cities or world heritage sites or national heritage sites. It refers also to post-conflict where unfortunately 
some armed conflicts deliberately erases people's memory, collective memories, and their ties to communities, cities, and nations. And by, by doing that, denying their cultural rights and citizens' freedom, and reflecting that or impacting that on huge post-crisis trauma. And the third one, which very little mentioned, have been in past frameworks and literature, is what we call urban crisis. And we see it a lot now, like, like you know, Arab Spring, for example. You know, look at the devastating impact of the Arab Spring as riots or civil unrest in, in cities like Aleppo, or in Syria, in Yemen, in many other cities. But also uh, city crises include um, riots or war on drugs or a major, major uh, events in cities. Uh, and as Magdalena mentioned, if you add this up, we are talking here about 200 million people affected every year by such kind of crisis, 60 million people displaced with arm because of armed conflicts, and uh, it translates that to economy, $314 billion damage and losses. So what the framework is saying, the framework is actually calling for uh, policymakers as well as practitioners, including in World Bank, UNESCO, all UN agencies and international organizations to place culture at the heart of the recovery and uh, reconstruction process. How you do that is that integrating culture and creative industries as well as intangible heritage in the recovery process and consider seriously consider norms and traditions and community preferences and perception in, in, the, in the recovery processes. And as Magdalena said, it has two principles, people-centered policies where community consultation and meaningful participation is essential. And I emphasize here meaningful participation um, and place-based policies where we look at the built environment during the reconstruction process and consider the recovery of infrastructure, housing, and facilities. By doing this too, that you allow two things. You allow the socioeconomic recovery to understand society's culture, uh, values, norms, traditions, priorities, uh, which are critical to acquire the cultural identities and sense of place that's in the recovery process. And it allows the physical reconstruction to bring strong, community ownership to reflect societal priorities and uh, operate sustainably to develop infrastructure, housing, and facilities that are linked to people, culture, and identity. And it's not, it, it goes beyond just conservation or, of, of, or preservation of heritage sites into the city as a whole. And to conclude, uh, I will just leave you with uh, five takeaways. Uh, or principles that came from the framework, which are very relevant to the topic of the uh, conference today. We have seven principles, but I would like to leave you with five of them quickly. One is to in engage communities and local governments in every step of the recovery process. Second, foster cultural expression to offer appropriate ways to deal with post-crisis trauma and reconcile affected communities. Third, acknowledge the city as a cultural construct where built structures and open spaces are closely linked to the social fabric. Fourth is to prioritize culture early, in, early on in the planning process, starting with needs assessment and the implementation of the emergency interventions that reflect community priorities. And fifth, which is my opinion most important, and that's a big lesson learned from the six cases we reviewed, is that uh, start the reconciliation process with the reconstruction of a cultural landmark or a place that people identity associate themselves with pride to them or places of significance to local communities, whether are cultural centers, religious centers, temples, mosques, churches, monastery. Start with the reconstruction of that because it will bring people together and they feel that their identities and values uh, are considered and uh, heard. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, uh, telling us so much in a very short time. And, and as you say, um, actually, it, what is key is eventually community ownership. Uh, that is also is very important. And this is why, you know, we focus, we try to focus and need to focus on uh, people centered approaches. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is uh, for uh, Zainab Gulunar. Uh, Zainab, uh, you are a restoration architect working in the field of disaster risk management on cultural heritage. Your main focus has been on early warning systems, emergency response, and planning in the post-trauma recovery phases of the disaster risk management cycle. Can you tell us about the establishment of the Crisis Monitoring and Response Working Group within ECOMOS, International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness, ICORP, and how this uh, working group or, or the work, you know, through this working group uh, on uh, crisis monitoring and response could contribute to responding to challenges of integrated reconstruction of heritage in post-trauma recovery? Thank you, Zina. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, May, for introduction and uh, uh, difficult question that we are trying to find the answer. And also, I would like to thank the organization committee for this very kind invitation and to dear friend to Amra Haji Mohamed Dovich. Uh, it's actually really difficult to make a reflection after this very important presentation uh, because they are prices, because they are coming from the ground experience. I would like to answer the question in two states. First, by giving the very brief information about the new working group of ECOMOS, ECORP Crisis Monitoring and Response for Heritage, and then by addressing the how this new formation will contribute or how we expect to contribute to the solution of the problems experienced in the integrated reconstruction of the heritage and post-trauma recovery phase. Actually, uh, the formation of working group within the working method of ECOMOS is always arise out of necessary. And the crisis monitoring and response for heritage also is a working group formed according to that same mechanism. Of course, it's not the first time we have experienced that cultural heritage faced disasters and as a result of this FX traumas that affect heritage and the community arise. However, as we all observed and experienced change in the trend of the events that had, have occurred in the recent period and are considered as a disaster in terms of scale, which would be appropriate to define as a actually a turbulent times, require the information of some new reflex at the institutional level. Uh, I would also like to briefly describe uh, how we describe this new uh, critical situation. Uh, in turbulent times, along the characteristic that distinguish turbulence from the other critical situations are its large, uncontrollable, and high velocity and blue nature and its cascading effect and unclear patterns of evaluation leading uh, to a chaotic situation in, uh, drastically. This leads into irrational demands that make no sense from a logical perspective and especially decision makers. Uh, on the field have a face to strong and relentless opposition that could escalate the conflict uh, to the upper next level. Uh, in this new pattern, and we all have experienced this multiple effects during the COVID-19 pandemic also, the crisis can grow rapidly and impact of the consequences can change the nature of the trauma. The approach to overcoming this new generation problems that this situation will create in terms of cultural heritage and the community by monitoring via cultural early warning and the cultural intelligence formations, and if, if necessary, by enabling an early transition of the first intervention phase uh, is of great importance for now. And the new working group of ECOMOS ECORP focus on the capacity building and monitoring and the response stage of the crisis. And this new mechanism that will allow for faster assessment and the potential response with regards to helping protect our, uh, our world's cultural heritage and the communities, especially in cases of crisis where timely emergency response is as a great importance. After all, we all have ex experienced the past trauma situation that the sooner the driving force of the cultural heritage come into play, the healthier environment and users uh, post-traumatic recovery phase. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab, uh, for uh, really <laughs> very quickly and just on time uh, giving us uh, information about the new working group and why it's important to focus on early warning signs and post-emergency uh, uh, recovery. Now, the third uh, question uh, goes to a colleague, uh, Senada Habibija. Senada, you are an architect by profession, living and working in Mostar, a city that suffered large destruction of its cultural heritage, including the old bridge. Can you tell us about your engagement with community-oriented projects and how such projects can help in gaining a better understanding of the importance of the city's cultural heritage especially in the context of addressing integrated reconstruction in post-trauma recovery. Thank Good day to everyone. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank first of all Professor Amra Haji Mohamedovic for inviting me and proposing me to take part of this program. Uh, before I uh, briefly say what I am working, uh, just uh, to make a short introduction on my first encounter, to, with the notion of the significance of the cultural heritage, which was uh, immediately after the war, as early as 1996, when I was still a student of architecture. That's uh, when I also met Professor Munir Bushnaki, to whom I send warm regards from Mossar today. I was also lucky, uh, or it was a destiny that my father was also an architect and uh, who had uh, and uh, lived uh, through big traumas uh, and he experiences the big traumas during the war, found his professional focus in the post-war reconstruction and restoration of cultural heritage, understanding that bringing back our heritage identity as of a crucial importance for our future, in particular after destruction of everything that belonged uh, to us as an identity, everything that was part of our daily lives that disappeared under the pressure of hate and neglect. It was at the moment that I realized and felt that we must have great emotions. We need to feel, we need to be broadened with the emotions uh, uh, in order to be able to profoundly understand the importance of cultural heritage. And that is exactly what I have learned then from both my father and Professor Munir Bushnaki. And unfortunately, the Mostar was uh, brutally destroyed, as I said, and uh, it uh, reflected onto our society. So almost 30 years after, it is still divided city. So for example, children of different ethnicities do not follow the same educational program. They do not learn about common values. We do not build in them a sense of attachment to cultural heritage. So for example, yesterday was the 28th uh, anniversary of uh, the destruction of the old bridge, where unfortunately only again Bosnian children came to mark a moment that should not be forgotten and where we should learn a lesson so that it does not happen again. Very little in that sense, at least locally, was put into education. Although we did have a lot of programs uh, uh, that was just mentioned also by Irsika uh, that developed in Mostara for the students of architecture in the 10 years just after uh, the war stopped in Mostar 2004. But uh, in a local context, it is very necessary to create a space and tools that will help the new generation to overcome the trauma of the past that unfortunately still exists. In one certain moment, I understood how important this is for Mostar, and uh, it's almost 10 years that uh, I started developing programs, including uh, architecture and art, as a tools uh, for creating uh, a dialogue, a space for dialogue for the youngster citizens of city of Mostar. Uh, so it was uh, at the beginning an uh, informal platform, but uh, the last three years uh, it's uh, called the uh, Idea Urban House. We give young people the opportunity to develop the sense of the importance of their participation in community. 
the programs that are mostly workshops or summer programs, summer schools, are oriented to the importance of a space, uh, of a city as a global unit, but also particularly related to the importance of the cultural heritage. We must awaken the need of identifying with heritage. Perhaps I myself would not understand the value in that way, I understand it today if I had not felt in 1996 back how much emotion and love should be put in the process of cultural heritage protection. M Mostar, uh, uh, so to say, is a city that really has to offer a lot to its citizens, but also to citizens of the world. And uh, to the, the first approval uh, for this quote was the process of the old bridge reconstruction, as it helped the peace building uh, process in, in Mostar, General, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. But we need to keep this to continue. But in order to, to, to succeed, we need to put a lot of hard work and a lot of time, as this is a very long process. Yes, yet as uh, we have been able to see at th this conference for all three days in all our societies there are individuals that i name like uh, lighthouses illuminate the path uh, that uh, we all need to take in order to preserve the legacy of our ancestors for those yet to come into this world so to conclude i would once more uh, underline the importance of uh, understanding personally, the personal understanding of a heritage, awakening this need to identify with the heritage. This is something that is so important. I believe in all of the countries that suffered the traumas like uh, our country did. And I would uh, uh, like to thank once more, in particular to Professor Amra Haj Mohamedovic, as uh, in a, and to share my pride that she comes from Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, selflessly shares her knowledge with all those countries and cities that have unfortunately survived uh, the fate that our country has survived. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senada. Thank you really for sharing uh, your personal experience uh, uh, growing up in the in the context of Mostar and how you are now, uh, you, know, you know, community uh, working on community oriented projects uh, and uh, highlighting how important it is to to somehow. Uh, as you say, I'd identify or or to be able to uh, to identify heritage uh, through working with communities. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sinada. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, the three panelists, as well as uh, the the four presenters of this morning, uh, for a very interesting and uh, and engaging session, uh, which will uh, hopefully contribute to the to the final. Uh, outcomes and proceedings of the, the conference. Uh, Amra, please, if you would like. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, DMA, for wonderful chairing of this session, to all the speakers, for all the knowledge that they brought into the uh, forum. And I would like just to um, tell you that the concluding session will take place at two Central European time. Uh, we will have a break now of one hour, and in fact, we would like to ask, uh, first of all, all chairs of the sessions to prepare a short um, sort of summary of conclusions of each session, and also each participant, if there is a, something that they would like to add as a conclusion, to use the opportunity during concluding session or to send to me email, uh, with the suggestions and important points that uh, you would like to be included into the final document. So thank you all and see you at 2 p.m. Amra, can you give me the opportunity to send my best, best regard to Senada? I didn't recognize her because I know her under Senada Demirovic and I worked with her father, uh, he was a very, very good friend. And uh, I think these are the two uh, people I was honored to meet in Mostar in difficult time when Mostar was half destroyed, if she remembers. 
Yeah. And uh, I really was, uh, I want to say how much uh, her contribution to a very good film, which was done uh, with the support of UNESCO uh, called Des Racines et des Ailes in French. And she was yes. really presenting a very, very nice uh, uh, image of, of the city of Mostar. Uh, and I think now I can say, you know, that with, uh, with my sister uh, Amra, my sister Senada, I feel uh, very, very close to all my Bosnian uh, compatriots. Thank you. Uh, if, if we are going into these kind of personal reflections, uh, I would like to say that probably at each part of the world where cultural heritage was uh, the target of destruction, Munir Bushnyaki has sisters and brothers and uh, uh, the people that he has been supporting. So we have been lucky to, in fact, have Munir among us as the people around across the world. Uh, Dr. Senada uh, Demirovic Habibia is um, uh, inheritor of the courage of her father, who was the director of the uh, Institute for Protection of Cultural Heritage in Mostar in the most difficult Time, he took this position after coming out from the detention camp where he was exposed to tortures during the destruction of Mostar. And he was the person that in fact uh, dived out the first stone from the river exactly. to be the first original stone of the Mostar bridge from the river. He was also a diver. So uh, yesterday, was a hard sort of uh, date for the world, not only for Bosnia, 28 years after the destruction. And I think that somehow, I do not believe that there is a coincidence. This conference takes part during this important date for the cultural heritage of the world. And uh, what was the warning to the humankind of the how destruction of cultural heritage inflict harm and mental wound to people, not, not only to society, to nations, but to individuals. And uh, I, I, I'm so sort of excited that this conference takes place when in fact we are marking such a dark um, anniversary for the humankind. So thank, thank you. you once again. Thank you, Amra, for giving me this opportunity. I was looking at the uh, picture and I saw that Senada, I know her, it, but it's not Habibia. I did know Habibia. <laughs> and now I know that Senada Demirovic is Habibia. Yeah, Habibia. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hello. So see you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.
So I would like to greet you, Rohit, Azra, Munir, May. Hello, Amra. Hello. 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 So. Hi. Hi. Great. How's Every the sound time? here? Trevor. Can you hear me? Uh, excellently. Hi, Amra. I'm just going to change my name on the. Um... Okay. Please do. <laughs> We all take off the headphones. This is nicer. Do you have an Good echo now? Afternoon. How are you? Hello. Azra. Hello. How are you? Trevor. So I see so many friends. Hello, Munir. Good to see you. Thank you. So Munir, you know Azra. I know everybody working in, in world heritage and uh, in cultural heritage. <laughs> oh, so great. Uh, in fact, I think that great people find the sort of peers. <laughs> <laughs> you know that my some of my, of my